This is a sample from our training at itdvds.com. If you'd like to learn more, please go to itdvds.com. Now let's go over to Server Manager. And for Nick Teaming here, let's click on Disabled. So we're going to create a team out of these two Nicks, which makes it look like one Nick. That's going to give us some load balancing, so we can use both Nicks at the same time. And it's going to give us some redundancy, so that if one Nick goes down, the other Nick is still up and running. And we're going to only use two NICs in this example, but we could use more if we needed more bandwidth. So we could use four or six even NICs if we needed to. If we need more bandwidth than that, we could use more gigabit NICs, but we probably want to look at using a, a 10 gig Ethernet card with a 10 gig switch if it's possible. So let's create our team here. I'm going to go to Tasks, New Team, and there's our two NICs that we want to use in our team. There's some additional properties down here that we're going to be talking about. If I scroll down a bit, there's a teaming mode, load balancing mode, and standby adapter. Again, we'll be talking about those in a bit. And for the primary team interface, if I click on this, we can give it a name if we'd like. Uh, by default, it's automatically generated. I'm going to call this team interface, though, Team 1. Now, down here, we can specify uh, if it should be put in a specific VLAN, and we would do this if the ports on the switch that these NICs were connected to were configured as a trunk. Mine are not. In this case, they're configured to be in a specific VLAN. So I'll go ahead and click OK. And click OK. Actually, we just need to give it a team name here. Again, I'll call it Team 1. Okay, and it may take a second for our NICs to come up, but my team is created. And now if we go look at our network connections here, we can see there's this new NIC called Team 1. And that's the one we would configure if we wanted to, So, but we're going to do that in a little bit. That's the one we'd put an IP address on, etc. And you can see if we right-click on one of the team members and go to Properties, all these boxes are now unchecked because this NIC is just part of the team. We don't really configure these two NICs anymore. We configure this new NIC that was created. Now let's go back and look at some of the different options we had with our team here. I'm going to right click on it and go to properties. Let's go to additional properties. So we've got a teaming mode here. We've got static teaming, switch independent, and LACP. So with switch independent, it doesn't matter which NIC is plugged into which switch. So if we have multiple switches that are connected to each other, we can connect one NIC to one switch and one NIC to another switch, and it'll work just fine. And that it's a very easy setup, and that actually can give us some switch redundancy, kind of like this here, where we, you know, we have one NIC plugged into one switch, one NIC plugged into the other switch. Those switches are connected, so traffic can flow all around. But if this switch goes down, well, this NIC's still connected to the good switch, so we still have network connectivity. With static teaming and LACP, we're going to need some configuration on the switch side. And with a Cisco switch, we would configure something called Ether Channel so that the switch knows, hey, these two ports that the NICs are plugged into on the switch, these two ports are part of a team. And with LACP, we configure ports on our switch with the LACP protocol, and then they can dynamically detect that they're part of the same team. So we might be thinking, man, uh, you know, static teaming and LACP, there's more configuration. It's much more difficult. Why would I want to use those instead of switch independent? Well, with switch independent, we get load balancing on traffic flowing out from our server to other destinations. But traffic going back in to the server, that type of load balancing would be handled by the switches it's connected to or the switch it's connected to in which case we would need some configuration on the switch like ether channel so that we can get that load balance balancing for traffic going back into our Hyper-V host. So that's the advantage. And we'll take a look at how to configure something like ether channel a little bit later on. Now let's take a look at the load balancing mode. We've got address hash and Hyper-V port here. These are the two older load balancing modes. For address hash, it decides which NIC to send the traffic out of in the team based uh, upon a few factors like MAC address, IP address, for the destination where the traffic's trying to get to. So what that means, if I'm trying to talk to PHX DC01, 
the traffic might go out this NIC because it's talking to a specific MAC address, IP address. If there's another server over here, the hash is going to be different because it's a different MAC address it's trying to go to and a different IP address. So it might send the traffic out on this NIC. So that's how we get the load balancing. For Hyper-V port, it's going to use the port on the virtual switch, wherever the traffic's coming out of, to determine which physical NIC to use for traffic. So if one virtual machine is trying to talk to one server and another virtual machine is trying to talk to another server, then those traffic might go out of different NICs because they're on different ports in the virtual switch. And then there's dynamic. This is really the best of both worlds and probably what we're going to use most of the time. And with this one, outbound loads are distributed based on a hash of the TCP ports and IP addresses. But the big advantage is in dynamic mode, it also rebalances loads in real time so that a given outbound flow may move back and forth between team members. And each one of these NIC is a team member. So we really get some dynamic load balancing. And for a standby adapter, if we want, we can choose an adapter that isn't being used. It's just waiting for a failure. And then it jumps in and takes over if there's a failure. Really, uh, normally you're just going to want all the team members in there because we get that fail failover anyways. So no real sense in having one NIC just sitting there doing nothing when it could be in use. One thing I do want to note is that if we do use like a static teaming, then the NICs in the team are going to have to be plugged into the same switch with Ether Channel in particular. Uh, that's what Cisco uses for the switch side configuration. So it would look more like this where we're plugged into one switch as opposed to getting some switch redundancy here by plugging into multiple switches. But with Cisco switches and other switches, they can be stackable. So we can have actually multiple switches instead of being connected with Ethernet cables or fiber cables. There's actually something on the back of the switch that we connect. Uh, it's normally proprietary type cable connection. We connect from one switch to another switch. And that makes it actually one big logical switch. But if there's a failure, then the other switch in the stack still works. We can have multiple switches in a stack, you know, four or five switches if we need to. It actually makes it easy to administer as well as give us some redundancy. So that's the way if we were going to use Ether Channel, how we'd get switch redundancies, we'd use stackable switches.